Hey love, my name is Brittany Pollard and you are now rocking with the Everyday Intentions podcast, your source for real conversation centered around stepping into your personal power one intention at a time. This podcast is all about owning our voice, taking up space, expressing ourselves and moving through life at our own pace. You are invited to the magic. So let's roll. What is up, my people? Welcome back to another episode of the Everyday Intentions podcast, y'all. My name is Brittany Pollard, and I'm the host of the show. And here we talk all about change, growth, and transformation through small, daily, intentional actions and thoughts. On today's show, I have the lovely Yolanda Williams. And let me tell y'all something. This episode right here... (laughs) This episode right here packs a hell of a punch, and I think this is my favorite episode to date, um, simply because the information is just so real, so jarring, and so it's just shit we need to know, stuff that we need to pay attention to, especially as parents, especially as Black parents, especially as anyone who wants to learn more about the Black experience and how you can really be mindful of what we are collectively going through. I think that this episode is just so powerful. Uh, Yolanda and I spoke all about conscious parenting for Black parents, which is very important. And I think it's so needed because we're all in the space of wanting to break generational trauma. It's this buzzword, but it's really something that we're out here doing. And so we talk about that. We talk about changing generational narratives. We also talk about raising liberated leaders, effective communicators, and what it's like to parent from a place of love instead of fear. Uh, We also talked about releasing control. We talked about active listening to our children and so much more. This episode really touched my heart, especially when it comes to raising little liberated leaders. If y'all know my son, Jaden, he is just that. And we talk about the importance of really creating that self-trust in them. So definitely a good one. Yolanda Williams is a certified positive discipline coach and host of the podcast Parenting Decolonized, a show that unpacks how colonization has impacted the Black family and teaches parents how to raise liberated Black children without breaking their spirits. When she's not advocating for the safety and liberation of Black children from white supremacy and parental oppression, she's chasing her toddler around the house and trying to remain sane. (laughs) I can relate to that. Y'all enjoy this episode. Get into it. What is up, my people? Welcome back to another episode of the Everyday Intentions podcast. My name is Brittany Pollard, the host of the show. And here on the podcast, we talk all about change and transformation through small daily intentional actions and steps. Today on the show, I have the lovely Yolanda Williams on the podcast, who's going to talk to us about decolonizing our parenting. This is something that I have been really work is, working on consciously doing, and I'm just really excited for Yolanda to come on and just share her wisdom and just give us tips and tricks on what we can do in our own parenting to help foster our babies. So Yolanda, welcome to the show. Thank you. Oh, I appreciate you. Thank you for having me, Brittany. Yes, of course. I would love for you to go ahead and just introduce yourself to our listeners too. Well, hey, listeners, my name is Yolanda, and I am the host of Parenting Decolonized, and it's just what the name says it is. I speak to my audience about how to decolonize their parenting, meaning unpacking what the effects of enslavement and colonization has done on the Black family and what that means for how we parent and teaching parents how to be more conscious, intentional parents. Yes. And I appreciate the fact that you've moved into just creating a platform to share more about this. I think that we're in a place where people are interested in learning and they want the tools and they want the knowledge. And so I'm just grateful for people such as yourself who are creating spaces like this to have these types of conversations. I just started reading uh, post-traumatic slave syndrome. Which, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> so there's just, there's so much. And I feel like that book was so educational and it just validates a lot of the stuff that we feel and how it is our responsibility to really start to shift 
these narratives, right? You know, exactly. She, Dr. Joyce, I always say her last name wrong, <laughs> but I, she and, and Dr. Stacey Patton are the reasons, are, you know, a lot of my inspiration about decolonizing. I remember when I first got that book and I read just her forward, just, you know, I started crying because she talked just about how, how some tribe in Africa would ask their greeting was basically, you know, how are the kids today? And, and that was so powerful to me because we think about how children are treated in the greater, not just in the United States, but in the world at large, they're treated like second-class citizens. They're treated very, you know, childism is, is super rampant across the board. And mm-hmm. when we really understand them, that children, once we, when we treat them well, then the, then when they grow up, they're emotionally well, they are to change the world. So many, I mean, look at me right now. We have so many people who are hurt in the country and you see the effects of not being a conscious parent just in the people around, around you. Right. So I think once we start asking ourselves, like, how are the children doing? Like, are they okay? And start making that something that we ask ourselves on a daily basis. We start seeing like how we treat children and how that affects the world at large. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When I read that, I agree so much with what you're saying. Cause when I read that, I was like, wow, Mm -hmm. they, everything that you're saying is just so on point because they're so, they acknowledge the children. Right. And it is more of a communal focus. Yeah there versus here, like you said, second class citizens. And I know in my own parenting, when I started doing my own personal development work, I really woke up to that. I was, I wasn't treating my child as if he was another human, Mm. right? Not treating him with the same type of kindness and, you know, just like do as I say mentality, you know, which is how I was raised. So, you know, you, you perpetuate what you know, until you decide to seek different or until lessons come your way and they, they wake you up to like, oh, okay, let me figure this out in a different way. So yeah. first of all, let's talk about, I would love for you to share with people what conscious parenting is. So the focus of conscious parenting is on the parents. You know, you have a lot, it, it, it sort of feels like positive parenting, which is generally how you discipline your children and creating a positive learning environment. But what I focus on mainly is as parents doing the personal development work that it takes to raise liberated and carefree, free thinking black children, right? So if you think about um, how your mood and your mindset and any traumas that you experienced, how those things affect how you react to your children and then choosing to react differently. You know, I always tell people that because of how I was raised, um, my first instinct is to, is violence, you know, is to spank her, is to pop her. And I have to intentionally stop myself from doing that. Now, I hate that about myself, but that's, you know, the programming from when you, when you grow up that way, you're, it's kind of like a programmed response to children. You think that's how they need to be treated. So I have to actually stop myself and gather myself, pause and, and choose to, to react differently to her. So it's really understanding ourselves, taking responsibility for our emotions, for our mood, our children. We can only control ourselves, right? So understanding that we can only control ourselves. We can't, our children are not property. They deserve respect. And then doing the things that it takes to heal those parts of ourselves that prevent us from seeing our children as full human beings, deserving of the same respect that we demand of them. Yes, I agree. And in doing my own work too, it it really got me. So there would be times, you know how when you're agitated and you're upset and you sometimes take it out on the people that you love the most. Mm -hmm. So you might be a little more short with your child and children bear the grunt of so many emotions from their parents because the parents aren't sure how to process their emotions on their Mm -hmm. own right. So I do agree that it is our job to really start to seek those places where we can learn and understand ourselves so that we can pay attention to those patterns. Because I know for me, the pattern that I grew up with was the, the whole don't talk back, you know, don't, I wasn't allowed to really have an opinion or express an opinion 
Otherwise, it's like, oh, you're being a smart mouth, right? I got that so much. I was a smart mouth, smart aleck. And that's because I just always had my own opinion of the world. And I seen how I was doing that to my son, how I was like, you know, just do this because I said so and don't talk back to me. And I, I realized when I started doing the work, how much I was shutting him down. And I look at myself now and as a person who has a hard time with expression, expression is something that I've been working on really, really deeply over the last few years because I've had this block of just going with the flow of what other people say and do and yes. not speaking up. And so tracing- A direct reflection, yeah. Exactly. So I'm like, I I want to break this. I don't want to have him grow up and not feel like he's unsure of himself or he's insecure right. and he can't advocate for himself. So I had to learn how to be a listener. Mm. And I think being a conscious parent is a part of being open, like you said, releasing control because you- like they are human in their own separate body with their own separate lives. Yes, you're there to guide and protect, but then you also can't control a lot of factors, right? So they're, they're gonna they're gonna do things that we don't like. They are their own person, exactly. And at the end of the day, all we can do is control how we react to those things. And a lot of times, especially you know, with with within the black community, we don't even know what is age appropriate behavior, right? So you get a lot of people who will say a child is bad, a child is um, a troubled child, all these things when they're literally acting like a child is supposed to at that age. It starts when they're toddlers. Children start getting hit and popped when they're when they're toddlers, right? Because they're touching things, they're putting things in their mouth, they're knocking things over. These are things that they're supposed to do, right? Because they need to understand the world at large. They're, they just, they're just been in this world for how many months, you know, 24 months or so. They don't understand what they're seeing. So they're trying to figure out, they're like little scientists. They're trying to figure out what is this thing? How does it taste? You know, what, 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 what happens when I knock this thing over? If I bang on this thing, what happens? They're trying to figure out the world around them. And then we start popping them and hitting them. Stop, don't do that. Instead of making it safe for them to explore the world around them, we we think our children should just fit into our world instead of us accommodating what they need in order to grow developmentally. So it, it takes a huge mindset shift because mm-hmm. how many times have you heard that baby is bad? That that baby and it's like a three-year-old. Three, how, what three-year-old is bad? <laughs> you know? Right. Three-year-old. <laughs> they don't understand. They don't have emotional regulation. Right, emotional regulation starts at three and a half to four. So people think a two and three year old should be able to just stop crying or stop whining or you know not have that tantrum. They can't control it. Right. They can't. They have no control over their brains at that time. When they feel the need to do something, they do it. So when you see a child, you know, a child hits you, they have no control over that. You have control over though, as a grown person, if you decide to hit them back, if mm-hmm. you decide to bite them back. You know, because that's the bad behavior that floats around some of these Facebook groups. Some of this bad advice. Bite them back. They'll they'll learn. No, that doesn't. How do you? You're being a hypocrite. You can't hit a child for hitting you. Like that doesn't make any sense. Mm -hmm. How about you just teach them? Hey, soft hands, gentle hands. You know, or give them what they want. Most of the time, it's an unmet need. They're hungry. They're tired. They're overstimulated. They need a nap. You know, learning their cues putting them on a schedule, all these things, making their environment safe, controlling the environment. These are things that are part of conscious parenting because when we do what we, we try to control what we can as parents, we can control their environment. We can control if they're putting things in outlets because we can cover them. You yeah. know what I'm saying? So it's like little things that people refuse to do sometimes. They're like, no, like my mom, Gia was over there and she's, my daughter's two. And she, every time she comes over there, she's like touching everything. And I, I start to move it. Don't move my stuff around. I was like, she's going to touch it. She's going to destroy it. Then be mad at me. I'm not paying for it. <laughs> yeah. And so she's like, she needs to be trained on how not to touch stuff. I was like, well, A, she's not a dog. But B, she's going to touch it because she's two. So either we can move it or we can leave. And so those are some of the boundaries I've had to set up with people in my life that don't understand the type of parenting I'm trying to do here. 
and that want me when I go over their house to conform back to that traditional style of parenting. I'm not doing it. I don't care whose house I'm in. So, oh my gosh. Yes. I want to, I want to speak on that too. <laughs> <laughs> because like, because... that pressure, right? They want yeah. you to just go, you better, you in my house, pop that baby. How about no? How about I just leave and you don't see okay. us anymore? Yeah. <laughs> oh, you don't play. <laughs> I will, I'm a supervisor. Like if, if I, if I can tell that you're not able to do the yeah. things that it takes to, you know, I don't expect everyone to be a conscious parent, right? I already know that's not possible. However, if you know, if you respect me and you respect my parenting, I expect you to at least defer to me if I'm there. Yeah. And if you can't, if it's still like, well, you're in my house. Okay. Well, we're going to leave. And when I come back, I'm not, I'm not leaving her with you. She, it will only only be supervised visits. These are just boundaries to protect your child who is more important than some adult's feelings, including your mom, including your father's feelings, including your grandmother's feelings. My child's emotional well-being is more important than these elders' feelings. Yeah, I said it. (laughs) But I agree with that. And I think that's a part of what it takes when we talk about you know, how general tra- breaking generational trauma like that is a, a, a hot topic because it's so true. It's like you have to stand up and say, OK, I'm choosing to change this by doing it this way. And nine times out of 10, it's not received well. It takes time for people to learn you. And that's how it is with my son. So he's 11. And the thing with him is, you know, how I spoke about like me really learning how to use my voice now and being shut down and that's the main thing that I have with him is communication, learning how to be a listener, learning how to meet him and and really hear his needs and taking away, like you said, the assumption of they should know. Your kids don't know what you don't model for them. Listen, And that was something that I got wrong for so long. You know, it's like, how do you not know how to tie your shoe? Well, have you really sat with that child and taught them how to tie their shoe? Or do you think they're just supposed to wake up and go from the little right. Velcro strips to the shoestrings and think that just because you taught them the bunny ears three times, they got it. Mm-hmm. It's like, no, your child doesn't know that. So it takes that open communication. And then also I learned the way in which I communicate to him. It's much more effective to say, hey, like just before you and I hopped on the call, he was in charge of doing the dishes. And so I went to go make some tea and I noticed like one of the mugs are dirty. So instead of being like, why didn't you wash this right? You know, going all off. I'm like, hey, I'm come and look at this. What do you, what do you observe? And he was like, oh, it's still dirty. I'm like, yes. So next time when you wash the dishes, let's move a little slower. Make sure that you are, you know, making sure that all the stuff is off of it. Because I know that you have the eye to look for those things. So, you know, it's just the, the way that we talk yeah. to them they can receive it so much better that way than berating them and being like, why didn't you do X, Y, and Z? And so to take that even further, us having, we we always have conversations. I feel like conversations can solve anything. And then also building that trust allows your child to come to you with, with anything, right? Anything that they, as long as if they feel comfortable with you and they know that you're going to be there to listen and yes, you know, provide guidance, then they'll be like, all right, I'm going to talk to her about this and just having that safe space. So we talk, we have little debates and rather than being like you talking back, which sometimes you do, and I'd be having to check him, but like for the (laughs) most part, it's like, okay, let me hear what you're saying. And so I have to teach other family members how to have that too with him because as I'm raising him to share his opinion, they get offended because they're stuck in that, in the patterning that they're used to. Mm -hmm. And I have to say, wait a minute, hold up. He's not talking back to you, but he's sharing what's on his mind. So like, I I would love for you to listen to what he's saying and not get so defensive so fast. I just wonder why it is that how fragile are adults that we feel so We get so upset with children having an opinion. It's so weird to me. Gia has a bit of a speech delay. She has some developmental delays. And so she's not speaking yet. And I cannot wait to be able to like have conversations with her. Now, don't get me wrong. Now I have a 13 year old niece and sometimes she'll say something to me. I'm just like, pause Yolanda inside. I'm just like, wait a minute. Why is she saying it like that? But I I tell her, I'm like, do you want to, do you want to rephrase that so I can ask you, answer you? 
you know, do you want to say that differently so it doesn't come off as so rude? And sometimes she doesn't hear herself speak. Yeah. But also, also, she has been modeled to be sarcastic. Our whole family is very sarcastic people. <laughs> mm-hmm. We are we are the kind of family that like pick on each other. Like that's mm-hmm. just a part of our family dynamic. She's picked that up. And so it feels weird when a 13-year-old does it versus we, us doing it. But that's all she knows. She doesn't know yeah. anything else. So when you are listening to your child and you start feeling yourself getting upset with the way they're saying something to you, I really want you to think about this. Have you said it to them that way? How are you modeling? <laughs> I'm serious. They are yeah. mirrors. They mirror yeah. us. They are holding up to us the parts of us that we should probably work on. Good, good, bad, and ugly, right? So mm. if you are saying to your child, you know, checking them in really harsh ways. And then when they start developing a little bit of voice, usually this is around 11, 12 years old, and they start modeling the, your ways, you got to you gotta change the way that you speak. And then you can tell them, don't talk to me like that. Now that, that feels different for a lot of people because it's just like, well, I should be able to do what I want. Should you? Yeah. Are you don't you want to don't you want to teach your child how to be an effective communicator? Because that's right. our job at large is to prepare them for adulthood. So a lot of people will say stuff like, "Well, if I don't do this, you know, their boss will fire them. If I don't do this, the police will get them." Right. So you have to be harsh in order for them to be a subordinate. I'm not I'm I'm not raising a subordinate, y'all. I'm raising a leader, and leaders know how to how to effectively communicate with people. Right. They know how to listen. They know how to get a uh, receive and give constructive criticism. So if you are raising a leader, because a lot of us are just like, I'm raising a king and a queen. Are you? <laughs> are you raising the person y'all who serves <laughs> the king and the queen? I'm just saying, yeah. because the king and the queen, they have to be diplomatic. Mm-hmm. And if you're not modeling how to be a diplomatic person, if you're a harsh person, a hard person, somebody that is just calling out, calling out the worst parts of them, doesn't praise the best parts of them, you know what I'm saying? That's not a leader because leaders don't do that. So that's the person you're raising. They're going to model that. They're going to go to school. They're going to talk to their teachers that way sometimes. They're going to talk to their friends that way or become bullies. The way that we model all kinds of things, our attitude, the way we deal with conflict, this is just the the pattern that we give them. Now, like me, I chose to do things differently when I got a little bit older. But when they're young like that, they're just soaking it all up. And so, I mean, it's really up to you guys. Like I said, are you raising kings and queens or are you raising the people who serve them? Because if you if you are raising leaders, then you got to check yourself. Yeah, I agree. And I think to further that, you know, you're saying on how they're going to communicate to their teachers, their friends and whatnot, but also largely the way that you speak to them is the way they're going to speak to themselves. Exactly. Yeah. Right. So that's where that, you know, a part of the inner critic comes from, because it comes from you know, everywhere in the world, wherever, whatever the child is exposed to. But I think that I know that was a big thing for me. I noticed the words that I say to my child, he's going to turn around and say to himself, the words that he sees me saying to myself, you know, those are the things that he's going to think is okay. And like, you see this model with girls growing up thinking that they need to be on diets or Mm -hmm. they're not thin enough. And that's because they watch their mom berate herself in the mirror for so many years that that's, that's normal for them. Right. I think, I love that we're just talking about like language and communication too, because that's like really been my focus on how we communicate, because I just noticed that the things that were said to me are the things that I perpetuate in my mind. And and sometimes it's subconscious, right? You don't even know where it came from. And you'd be like, damn, why am I talking to myself like this? You know, (laughs) but yes, we can either contribute to that inner critic or we can contribute to, I don't know, their inner champion. I don't know what the opposite of the inner critic is. No, it's a champion because kids do blame themselves for things. So they blame themselves for your bad mood, right? Always in a bad mood and you're stressed out. But a child is still throughout the world at large. So they're, they're thinking because they think, and most of the time they're right that they are the center of our lives. So if you're always stressed out and always in a bad mood, they're thinking like, man, she doesn't want to be around me. Mm-hmm. He doesn't like me. 
I grew up thinking that way. I, for the longest time, up until my like mid twenties, until I realized my mom was a person, you know, cause that's a whole other conversation. I didn't <laughs> understand that my mom was like a person outside of being a mom. Right. And, oh my goodness. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So I didn't realize that in, until in my mid twenties, but before that, I thought that she didn't like us, that mm-hmm. her life would be better without us, that we were just burdens, because that's how she treated me. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I knew she loved us, but I didn't know that she liked us. Mm-hmm. And I wanted to be liked. I wanted my mom to sit and talk to me. I wanted every time that she had something to say that it wasn't a criticism or a command, you know, that it was mm-hmm. just getting to know me. Yeah. And even to this day, I'm not even sure she knows me because she gets surprised at me. I can't believe you said that. You should know me by now. <laughs> yeah, I said that. Okay. So it's just like, we have to get to know our children. And that is an ongoing thing because they're constantly changing. And as they evolve into who they're going to become, we have to change all the time to sort of evolve with them, right? So who you, your, your son at 11 is going to be completely different than when he's 13, right? So mm-hmm. when in, in two years, you're going to have to like kind of navigate who this new person is, you know, you know, who, what are his, what are his friends? Like all this stuff is going to change so dramatically in these, in these next coming years that we have to be willing to sit our kids down and not just like have a formal conversation. But like you said, you like to just have a, have talks with your son. Is that what we really want? is to form a bond, form a connection. Mm -hmm. And that connection is going to help when they need protection. So when your child is experiencing all these things as teenagers, I mean, I I used to just be getting into all kinds of stuff, right? My mom never knew about it because I didn't feel comfortable talking to her about it. Yeah. Because I didn't feel comfortable because she used to criticize the small things. Why the hell wouldn't she criticize the big stuff? I didn't feel safe. So the small nitpicky, all the the rules and nitpicky stuff that a lot of parents think they need to do, Is it connecting you to your children or is it pushing them away from you? Is it making you accessible to them or is it making you look like, man, I can't talk to her about nothing. She, she's way too strict. She doesn't listen to me. She doesn't know me. A lot of kids will say that she doesn't understand me. She doesn't know me. Well, why not? We have to do the work. Yeah, I agree. I agree. And I talk about this all the time. And, and this is something that I'm very honest with my son. His name is Jaden. I'm very honest with Jaden about is how you were talking about every, like every year it's something new, right? We think we get used to them. And then here comes another year of development. Mm-hmm. And you're like, oh, here we go. A whole new person. You, a whole <laughs> new person. But I tell him that I'm like every, at every moment, like you're learning about yourself. I'm learning about myself because we're different too. You know, parents just don't get to a certain age and stop developing also. So every year it's a new layer for us as parents that we discover. And so what I like to call it is co-creation. It's like Mm -hmm. at all times we're co-creating and forming this new bond and new relationship and new ways of relating to each other based on where we're both individually at in our lives. Mm -hmm. It's the same thing that you would do if you had, you know, a partner or a friend, you know, you create new ways to connect with each other. And I think that's a big thing too. And that's where I come back to saying like, your kid is an actual human who is going to grow up. An actual human. An actual human, ladies and gents, who who is going to grow up. So it's important to establish those bonds. And then, like you said, release control. And I want to talk on this too, because I think this is really important when it comes to decolonizing parenting. I feel like parents, especially Black parents, are more harsh because the world isn't as safe for us as it is Mm -hmm. for other people, right? So I see where the control comes from. You need to conform. Otherwise, you're unsafe. Otherwise, that is, you're going to die, essentially, especially when it goes, like when we trace that trauma back to you know slavery like people couldn't speak out couldn't talk couldn't read like anything their lives were threatened and then we see all of the police brutality you know that happens on and off the news right the thing imagine the things that we don't know about from people just being innocent and living their lives and being a so-called threat anyway and then having either their lives taken or or put in jail I mean I, I every Black man I know has been harassed by the police. Yeah. So as a mom, yes, there's that fear of you need to conform. Otherwise, your life is in danger. So knowing that there are very real threats Mm -hmm. out there, 
how do we hold that and then also raise these conscious, liberated children who are effective communicators? How do we do both of those? Well, the first thing is you cannot parent from a place of fear. As scary as it is, I don't know what good thing fear ever brings about. It doesn't, yeah. when you are in fear, when, you're, when your body's in that state, when you're reacting from that state, no good decisions are made ever. Right, yeah. And so we have to, acknowledging like right now, I'm, I, you know, it's scary to be a Black mother. And even with a Black girl child, I'm just like, wow, like, you know, it's, it's one of the biggest reasons I didn't even want to be a parent, to be honest with mm. you. So understanding that and accepting that, hey, I'm afraid. I want to make sure my child is safe. I want to make sure they make it to adulthood, right? But not not leading from that place. Leading from a place of love. Because why why do we need to be as harsh as the world? The world is, is already Ooh, so yeah. hard and and harsh to our children. Why would we want to bring that into our homes? Our homes should be safe havens, places that they can express themselves openly, mm-hmm. places where they where they can show the full range of human emotion openly, right? Because when they do meet a police officer who is trying to dehumanize them, so here's the thing. A lot of people don't agree with this, but I am not raising the type of person that's just going to, you know, the police is like, let me look in your car. I want you to be like, do you have a search warrant? Oh, yeah. You know what I'm saying? So we have to be, we have to raise children who understand and know that they have a voice and that they should use it. Mm-hmm. And so when they're met with teachers who want to who want to treat them uh, badly in the classroom, instead of sitting there and taking it and doing these racist assignments, my daughter's going to get up and be like, I'm not doing this. Call my mom. <laughs> you know, she ain't going to school anyway, but still. That's Jaden. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Because you're raising a free thinker. Yeah. So what we want, we don't want our, I don't want to, Gia to conform. Conformity has gotten us where? It's 20, it's 2020. Where, where's it gotten us? A whole lot of nowhere. Right. Okay. It's time for some 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 stuff to be, you know, changed up. It's time for these, uh, you know, these children to be raised as free thinkers who will help change the trajectory. Now, we can't control white supremacy and we can't control racism. Right. But we can control how we react to it. We can create people mm. who want to be leaders, who want, you know, kids who want to be a president want to be judges because that's where the change comes from. We have to, they have to be willing and have the confidence to say, I can do that. I can be in these positions of power. How can they do that when we are beating them down, beating the confidence out of them, tell them that, that they ain't nothing, making them conform to the ideals of white supremacy, because that's what's going on. A lot Mm -hmm. of black parents in their fear become gatekeepers of white supremacy. They become the thing that, you know, all this internalized racism, they project it onto their children. Okay. The way they making fun of AAV, Mm -hmm. our children should be able to speak the way they want to speak, especially at home. Yeah. Proper English is a racist sort sort of what is what is it called? I don't remember. So it's like we have to be willing to allow them some of this, some of the things that we felt that we feel uncomfortable with and things that we aren't, um, that we didn't have as growing up. Like you said, having a voice, being able to express their opinion, giving them the confidence to know that not just can you be anything and do anything, but I can help you become the person, right? That because we can we can tell our kids, hey, you know, dream big. But if you're not giving them the foundation and allowing them to like even talk to you about what that dream is, or if you're shutting stuff down, or if you're calling them names and beating them, you know, get smacking them around and everything, they're not gonna have the confidence to reach those dreams. At we can't control what happens on the outside, right? Again, this goes back to all about control and boundaries, but we can control our home. And in this home. Blackness is centered, okay? This is a this is a space for, for opinions and voices to be heard and for my child to feel like she can be herself, whatever that means. That's how we are able to raise these liberated, free-thinking Black children. Cannot do that if we're treating them like the world treats them. If we treat them like the world treats them and how police might treat them, well, we're just going to get more of the same. Right. We're the same. We wonder there's a, besides systemic reasons for, you know, black wealth, the generational wealth gap, there's also some cultural reasons for it too. Mm -hmm. 
Woo, you better preach. <laughs> I mean, how can we, we, we all, fire. all these people are like, we should just, we should raise entrepreneurs. Everybody cannot be an entrepreneur, number one. But number two, again, that takes confidence. And it takes for you to feel confident in yourself, to be able to have, to take risks and to be able to think independently, right? Not conform. That's what an entrepreneur does. It does not, it does not conform. So we cannot, Mm. I do, you know, conformity is a tool of colonization. It is a tool of colonization. You don't want your children to conform. You want them to be free thinkers, to have opinions and to be able to share those opinions and advocate for themselves when they need to, when you're not around. Cause, oh, yeah. cause I've seen it on social media when it's just like, well, why, why didn't that child say something to the teacher or to the police officer when, you know, they, when the police officer shouldn't have been doing something. And it's like, well, I, they couldn't say nothing to you at home. What are you talking about? <laughs> yeah. You know, they don't have, they don't, they don't have the practice. Cause that's well, what that's home what I'm is. Saying. Practice. It comes, right. And it comes back to assuming they should know something yes. when you haven't taught them that thing. Yeah, I want to circle back to just what you were saying about making sure that our children feel comfortable in their home. And this was a conversation and and you were talking about raising a young Black girl. Mm -hmm. And I was talking to a friend of mine and we were talking about, especially with, with our young men, right? In society, we are the only ones who, who touch and love on our young men especially when they're little, right? Like, especially for a young boy, it's not like he's going to school and getting hugs and stuff from his friends. So it's like all of that affection as our mom, it's our job to give them that, to hug them, to love them, give them kisses on the cheeks so they know what that feels like. Because when they go out into the world, the world is not going to give them that. Mm -hmm. So it starts from the home. And then also when it comes to raising these free thinkers and the ones who aren't afraid to speak up, like, that's why I was like, that is my JD boo, because (laughs) he had, he had an issue with his teacher where he, for whatever reason, he didn't want to do the Pledge of Allegiance. He said, while Donald Trump's in office, I'm not doing the Pledge of Allegiance. Yes, JD boo. And so, yeah, he, he amazes me. And so he, he sat down and didn't do it and he got in trouble. His teacher told him that he needs to at least stand. And he was like, I don't want to stand. Why am I standing? And so she pulled his, you know how they have like the behavior charts. So she pulled exactly classist and racist. But exactly. <laughs> exactly. So she she pulled his chart down and, and he got upset about it. And he was like, Mom, I feel like when I stand up for myself, I'm penalized. And I'm like, no, no, no. So I went up there and I was like, look, if my child doesn't want to do the Pledge of Allegiance, he does not have to. You will not be in here marking down his behavior, especially if he's just minding his own business. He's not up talking, causing a disruption. He, he literally just sat down. It's like a quiet protest he was doing, right? And so she was like, well, there's an expectation for all students to da-da-da-da-da. And now we're seeing more students not want to do it. And I was like, well... As leaders, and this is where, because I work in the entrepreneurial space, so I know what it means to be, you know, that person who's a nonconformist. And that's just, that's just who I've always been. (laughs) But I'm, and I told her straight up and I was like, well, as leaders of this organization, you, you guys are the ones who are in charge of these children while they're at school and in your care. And if you are seeing this, why not take the time to make a space for these children instead of penalizing them for not conforming. And then she just looked at me and came up with some other excuse. And I was like, look, he's not doing, he was sitting right there the whole time. Good. And I think, you know, they, they need to see that too, that they're not in the wrong for having those opinions. And as a parent, like you can, like at the end of the day, I, I respect all teachers and also you have to go in there and it goes back to teaching people how to treat your child. Right. Right. So, yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, if we don't advocate for them, who will? Because let's just keep it mm-hmm. really real right now. The public education system is not for Black children. Mm-hmm. They are suspended at higher rates. They are, they are disciplined at higher rates. And a lot of the time, yeah. it's punitive punishments. Now, first of all, teacher, it is his First Amendment right 
to sit down outside of this protest. That's so unless you, unless you would like a lawsuit, I'm going to need for you to leave my son alone, okay? See, the thing is, they don't expect us to go up there. They only mm-hmm. expect us to go up there talking about, and I get this sometimes, you know, um, I get even black teachers sometimes will just be like, I only hear from parents when they're complaining about something. So we do have to make sure that we are involved in all aspects of our child's education and showing up even to not complain, but also to give encouragement, all all that other good stuff to teachers. But I need for y'all to also start believing your children because a lot of us will just take our, the teacher's word for it and Let's not always do that. Sometimes teachers lie. These are human beings. These yep. are these are just human beings, just like you and I. They will get fed up. Sometimes they don't like children because of their interactions with them and they form an op- opinion about it. They're human beings. So there are times when your child is telling the truth, like, hey, my teacher did this. It wasn't fair. And and they got punished for it. And you just believe the teacher. That's that's not we they have to know that we trust them in that way. Now, if your child has been doing some lying or whatever, you can always say, okay, I would like to get the teacher's side of things. I'm not saying I don't believe you, but I think it's always fair to get both sides of the story. Right. And that way they know you're listening, but just to be like, your teacher said this and now you're in trouble and not give them a chance to defend themselves or to talk to you about it is really unfair. It's yeah. really unfair. So, uh, you know, I'm I'm so happy you went up there and, and advocated for him. And she was definitely wrong. Okay, what her number is. <laughs> Call her up. Yeah, she was telling me they have stuff in the handbook. And I was like, well, I want to see the handbook. It, it was a long meeting. I don't give a shit about your handbook, lady. My child doesn't want to stand up for this. And, <laughs> and he's just not. And that's the thing. Like, you can write it all down. but And, and I think this is a good lesson when our children, they, they will be penalized. They will be. One of the biggest concerns for the parents in my conscious parenting group and Facebook is, okay, I'm raising these free thinkers, but the world will penalize them for being this way. Yes, they will. They're not used to it. We're not used to it. We're not used to a world, especially where any child, but especially a Black child, is able to 100% be themselves, advocate for themselves, use their voice to stand up for themselves. You know what I'm saying? Just have an opinion. We're not used to it. So you will have teachers across the gambit, Black, white, Puerto Rican, or Asian, who will penalize them for the way you're raising them. And I think that's part of the conversation that you start having with them as they get older. When they start standing up for themselves, hey, you know, just so you know, sometimes it's the kind of stuff you might encounter. And it's not to scare them, but they should be informed. They should be informed. Our children are actually able to handle much more than we give them credit for. They're very smart. It's very resourceful. And it's been shown that especially toddlers, before they get into the public school system, that children are creative geniuses. They figure out problems quickly, much more effectively than adults do. Once they get started getting into the public school system, some of that, well, a lot of it goes away. Because what is public school, if not a place of conformity? You have to do this thing all the time like this. They don't like individuality unless it's a certain type of school. Most public schools are not for Black children. They definitely are for children who are trying to be, you know, free thinking, parents who are raising free thinkers and and conscious children. That's just the way the world. Yeah, my mentor, she was a part of the public school system for 10 years. And I was telling her about the situation with Jaden. She was like, first of all, rule number one of the public school, you know, that whole situation is that kids are liars and don't believe them. That's Mm -hmm. the foundation of all, you know. It's very childish. It's very much centered on the adults. Right. Yeah. Right. I agree. So, yeah, I think it's important to to raise them and to prepare them on what to expect should they decide to not conform, right? I think that's that's the best. And and everything we're saying in this conversation comes back to spending time with your child and preparing them, you know, you are the soil from which your child grows from. So you got to make sure that you are not only taking care of yourself. Mm -hmm. And I want to shift and just talk about what we as parents can do to really take care of ourselves, indulge in our, engage in our own self-care so that 
we can become models to our children. But when we take care of ourselves, then we have the capacity to grow and raise these types of children. So I want to talk more about, I know we touched on like doing your own personal development. And then earlier in the conversation, we were just talking about really taking a pause and not getting so reactive when your child shares something with you. But what are the other things that we can do to really care for and nurture ourselves while we are trying to, because I know a lot of people are in the process of decolonizing themselves. So it's like, I'm, I'm working on this so that I can learn this stuff integrated and teach it to my child. What are some other ways in which we can learn how to care for ourselves? Because yes, boundaries is a thing. I think people, I mean, because we are, we have, we've been the working class, right? So conforming and not having boundaries that has just kind of just left us empty right so what are what are some other things that parents can do to make sure that they're creating that safe container within themselves first and becoming comfortable with themselves first it's such a good idea i'm sorry <laughs> such a good just segue into this because i a part of conscious parenting is also taking care of ourselves right because uh, our our mood and our you know the the traumas that we may have experienced they really affect how we parent and so mm-hmm. understanding ourselves better understanding how we cope with with adversity when things what is racism? I think that's a really good thing just to to learn about mine is avoidant distraction that's what I do oh, that's um, <laughs> yeah <laughs> and and so I you know I tend to turn off sometimes in order for me to get through things. And what I've found really helps in this kind of self-help space is asking for help. Now, I know a lot of people are just like, I don't have a village, but I feel like everyone at least has one good friend or one family member. And if you, and if you don't, that may mean that you need to spend a little bit of money on hiring someone to come in and give you a break, asking yeah. for help. Hey, I need, I need a break. I, I can't handle this right now. I need to have some alone time, which I yeah. just did. I need, as a single parent, we're together all the time. I need some alone time sometime. And so I lean on my family a lot Mm -hmm. to be able to take her when I need it or come and, you know, they'll come and I'll be able to take a nap in the other room. It's just being able to ask for help. A lot of us don't do that. A lot of us feel like I'm a burden when I do that, or Mm -hmm. no one's going to want to help me. Or if someone said no before, now they feel in a way, like they said no before they don't, they don't want to be helpful. And that's not true. People can say no to you. Okay. doesn't mean they don't want to help you. It just means that today I can't do it. So I think we need to start being, we need to just examine how we approach support and help Mm -hmm. when we, you know, being able to reach out to other people is a huge part of this whole parenting thing. We cannot do it alone. That's a big one for me is asking for help, receiving that help. Cause I've, you know, I've had people that were just like, I want to do this. And I was just like, ah, you know, it made me uncomfortable that yeah. people were were offering these things because in my mind, I'm just like, what they want. That's just the way I was programmed. Oh, yeah. Yeah. If someone's at just doing something, people don't just do things out of the kindness, kindness of their heart, right? There must be something that they want or they might want something later on, you know, and it's just not true. I have begun to really believe that people are just inherently good people. And if they love you, they want to help you. And I have to receive that. You know what I'm saying? I have to be willing to receive that. And 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 I love that I'm doing this now because it was so hard for me for so many years. I don't want Gia to see me doing all on my own and thinking that that's okay because it's not. Ooh, so yeah. yeah, again, goes back to modeling. All this stuff that we're doing, all this personal development, it will teach your child some stuff while they're seeing you going through it. And the, the changes that you're making, you're just silently teaching them things. So asking for help, I want her to be able to ask for help. Taking time for myself, I understand that's not selfish. That's a necessity. Yeah. Self-care is not optional. It is something that you have to do. You cannot pour from an empty cup. If you have nothing left to give your children, you'll find yourself snapping on them, wanting to pop them. Your patience is real thin. You know what I'm saying? You have to figure out Okay, especially if you have a partner, I tell people in this group all the time, just like, who in here has a partner? Okay, what? Because I notice these moms will say stuff like, you know, my partner's been working all day and I'm exhausted and all these stuff happened. I'm just like, okay, so you've been working all day too. 
because you, you stayed at home with the kids. So that is a job. Okay? I'm trying to figure out why you feel like you haven't been at work all day because you have. Right. <laughs> but the difference is you didn't have to, you, you had to stay in the house or you had to be with the kids. At least he got to go out and, you know, and, and do all this other stuff. So working with your partner to figure out how can each of you get some alone time, get some time away from the kids and then finding how to spend time together. Cause that's a big part of it too. And your nutrition and your sleep, mm-hmm. all these things kind of go into like how you're able to show up for your children. If you are tired, if you're lethargic, cause you ate McDonald's five days in a row, all yeah. these things affect how you show up for your children and it's intentionality. All these things is all about being intentional, intentionally eating the right food or the, or healthier versions of the right food, of, of the wrong yeah. food intentionally finding ways to get out into nature and getting some vitamin D and revitalizing yourself, intentionally figuring out, figuring out how can I, you know, who can I lean on? Who can I call for support when I'm really going through it? My kids are really trying me and I'm trying to maintain how to be a conscious parent. Who can I lean on in those moments? Who's not going to criticize me and say, I told you, so you should just be hitting them. You need to have Mm -hmm. the, you know, people in your life that won't judge you, and that you can turn to when things get a little bit rough, because trust, this is not an easy way to raise your children at all. It's hard. (laughs) It's hard, right? It's not easy. So you have to have those people in your life that when you call, like I'll go into my Facebook chat with some girlfriends that I have. I'm just like, Gia's on my last damn nerve and I'm, mm-hmm. I feel like I'm about to lose it. And they all come to my aid and they're just like, what can you do? They give me all these ideas, you know, that's the support I need. And so I encourage you to find those people too, that you can just reach out to and just be like, Hey, I'm about to, I'm about to lose it on these kids. Like what, you know, and, and find some support and not the person who will tell you to beat your kids. Cause that's not supportive. The person yeah. who, even if they think that way, they at least won't say it, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah. So some of the things that I think are important in order for you to be a conscious parent, it's about intentionality. I agree. And I think at the base of all that you're saying, I also think that you, you really need to see that you are deserving of it. You are deserving. So I think that's another thing where people don't feel like they deserve help. And then there's like that paranoia, what do they want? They want something from me. And that's simply because it comes back to that root feeling of like, I don't deserve help. Or, you know, when it comes to being intentional about nutrition, choosing what you eat, that plays into you ultimately understanding that you also deserve to feel good. You know, like this is a whole, it's a learning experience for everyone, but at the root of it all, I think, especially Black people, just having that feeling of I deserve goodness in my life. I deserve, you know, I deserve good friends. I deserve good people. I deserve support. I deserve to be nurtured yes. and cared for. It comes back to that root word for me. That word kept popping up as you were talking. Yes. So even just sitting with that, because if you don't feel like you deserve that, then you're going to end up going into that avoidance or, you know, whatever it is, you know, whatever, whatever your, I call these like protector is. To, mm-hmm. to shy you away from the thing that you want. For me personally, it comes from a space of like, I don't know if I deserve that. Yeah. So if I sit with that and be like, okay, what will feel good for me? And I also think like, I love that the tips that you gave and I want to encourage those who are listening to really, I, I love to, to get into a space where I visualize things and some people journal or whatever it is. But get into a space like, okay, here are the things that make me feel good. Like in my home, we eat a lot of healthy stuff. That's just who I am. And I caught a lot of flack for that when I got into fitness and the healing arts and stuff for my family. And that that was like a whole other decolonization yes. part of my life. But it's like, okay, these are the things that make me feel good. These are the people that I know I can trust. These are, are the activities that make me feel good. And once you start doing those and you identify with like that, I, it's like freeing and light for me. Mm-hmm. Then I notice how my mental capacity to parent just dramatically shifts versus like you said, if I'm tired, if I'm lethargic, then I'm a little more short and I got to go like sit myself in a corner mm. and get it together. Right. <laughs> but I think it just comes back to like creating a list of the things that make you happy and make you feel joy. And just knowing that it's okay to not have your child in a part of some of those. 
right? Oh, listen, I tell people, I have asked this so many times and I have to say, your children are not included. Your family is not included. <laughs> yes. What brings you joy? Yeah. Outside of your family and outside of, you know, and, I, and, and so I'll put family and people will be like my kids, man, that's family. <laughs> Stop it. Right. What part, you know what I'm saying? What parts of your life or what things bring you joy and how can you cultivate more of that? Yeah. You know, what are those things? List at least five, keep them with you. So when, when you are at a loss and you're just like, how can I feel a little bit better right now? And it could be something small, meditation, prayer, music. I know right now with all the stuff that's going on in the world, music has been a great outlet for me. You know what I'm saying? Talking to a good friend on the phone. I'm going to just say it. I know you, you're, you know, healthy and everything else, but I really like eating chocolate. So, if Oh, I- no. Please, no judgment. <laughs> if you could see the chocolate in my freezer right now. You know, I'm saying a piece of chocolate <laughs> just to kind of just be like, this tastes so good. And I'm not going to even lie, chocolate with some really beautiful glass of red wine. Yes. That's, <laughs> those two things together bring me joy. So it's just kind of like, what are those things? And and understand you're because you're you you are a person outside you are a human being outside of your children they are a big part of your life but they're not your own the only part of your life i am a woman who has needs i'm an entrepreneur who has needs and these are the things i have to i have to like be kind to myself understanding that i can't everything i can't say that my daughter is everything she can't be my, that's a lot to put on a child. My, my kids are my everything. That's a lot of responsibility to yeah. put on a child because they're not going to yeah. always meet your expectations. And then you get resentful because you're like, I gave you everything. Nobody asked you to give them everything. They need right. you to be happy, happy with yourself. They need right. you to pursue your dreams as well. They need you to be happy and joyful outside of them. I mean, it's the same thing as asking a partner to be your everything. It's the same thing. It's too much pressure because you're going to resent them when they don't meet your expectations. Because believe me, you have them. You have expectations of behavior and of gratitude that they should express to you for the things that you do for them. And I'm here to tell you right now, your kids owe you nothing. They don't even owe you gratitude because they didn't ask to be here. (laughs) So, you know, a lot of parents are just like, well, I just do, you know, I mean, all the sacrifice is good for you. That's what you're supposed to do. You're a parent, right? But, but why do you expect them to, to be so like groveling at your feet because you just, you you chose, this is a choice you made Mm -hmm. in the moment to do all these things. Either you do it because you love them and you want to do it, or you do it expecting gratitude and expecting to be paid back in some way. Which one? You can't have it both ways, you know? Yeah, I agree. Yeah, you are just coming back to even just indulging into your self-care, just coming back there like you are allowed to exist outside of the space of your child. And I really want to hone that in for people because you're that model, right? So when your child sees you off doing things that nurture your soul, they're going to grow up. And they're going to have healthier relationships to other people Mm -hmm. because they're like, I'm allowed to exist on my own. And whoever I bring in my life is just going to, not everybody is going to enhance you. Well, I can say like, they, they'll teach you things, right. But it also helps you to discern coming back to that feeling of deserving and knowing what goodness feels like in your body and making decisions from there. So it's also a boundary, you know, it's also a boundary, even with your children. Hey, I'm a, you know, this is my alone time. Especially oh, yeah. when they're older. Even those. Yeah. Yeah. This is my alone time. Please respect my alone time. And mm-hmm. if, and and them seeing you and under you know, talk to them about that, what that means. But them seeing you do that, it makes it okay for them to do that when they're a little bit older. Because trust me, I as someone who is struggling with codependency because of the way I was raised, just made another therapy session the other day because I realized my codependency makes me feel guilty whenever I do things for myself. And it, and I have to always sit with that guilt for a minute. Otherwise I'll, you know, choose the other person or the other thing over myself. So I'm just learning these techniques in order to be able to stop being so codependent. But because of how I grew up, this is the way I am right now. And yeah. I don't want her. I don't want to model that for her. And I don't want her to, to be in, you know, have these codependent relationships with friends and, and boyfriends, girlfriends, whatever. I want her to be able to say, hey, I need my space. Please respect that. Right. Yeah, I agree. I recognize codependent patterns with 
my boyfriend. And I, I, I know the feelings of resentment when you expect this person to yep. be something. And then it's like, wait, we never actually talked about this. Like people can't read your mind Mm-mm. and they don't know things. And then I also expected him to be all those things. I expected him to be my best friend, my workout buddy, you know, to, to want to like garden with me and all this stuff I threw <laughs> on him that we never talked about and stuff that he's not even interested in. Yeah, right. But I was like, you just don't spend time. If you with love me. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Like you just don't spend time with me, but it wasn't him at all. It was me mm-hmm. pouring all of me into him and not realizing that he can't be that person. And I don't want him to be that person yeah. either. Like, I think relationships are beautiful, but then he can't be everything. He can't be my homegirls. Like he can't, you know, he, he can't do those things. So it's so much power in you really zoning in on your own life. And I, it just goes back to like, well, as an example, you know, when you're in an airplane, they teach you to put your mask on first before you help anybody else. So really taking the time to to nurture yourself. And then as you're nurturing and you're learning, shifting those patterns that you are noticing are unhealthy, because sometimes stuff will just come up, especially yeah. when you're getting into your own work and you're like, oh, that did not feel good to say it that way. Mm-hmm. And I'd be having those times, too, where I have to like call Jaden in and be like, yo, I apologize for the way I communicated to you. And I think telling your children, Ooh, apologizing to your children is big. huge. It's so I mean, huge. Yes. How many apologies did you hear growing up? None. Not a <laughs> not, single. Not a one. Not <laughs> Not a until one. I got older. And then yeah. I, like when I became a woman, then my mom was like, you know what? I, I apologize. But I get it as a, as a grown woman now, the pressure that she was under. Well, I, I can't even say I get it because she had three of us and I just have my one. But I, I see where that frustration can build up and you take it out on your kids. And so I, I'm not perfect. And I don't want anyone listening to this podcast to think I'm perfect because I am yeah. not. But there are patterns where I see like, oh, shoot, I, I messed up. I'm like, hey, I just want to let you know that I was like irritated because of something that happened maybe like at work. And I was like short with you. So I apologize for the way I communicated. It wasn't you. It was that. And I think being honest about yes. that, it lets them know like, oh, shoot, mom messes up too. Oh, you know, it's so she big. About me, yes. Right? <laughs> Yeah, and and, so. and besides the messing up, it just is also models to them that it's okay to apologize. Mm-hmm. How many people do you know have a hard time saying I'm sorry or apologize? A lot of people. Yeah, it's because it was never modeled. It, right. it, it's that it's that pride, it's that ego that says it's you know that puff upness that's just like I'm right, and even when I'm wrong, I I can barely say that. You know, Gia has heard apologies her whole life. She's only two. Cause I've messed up so often (laughs) and every time I do it, every time I yell or every time I want, you know, I apologize to her and she, and I haven't even done anything yet. Cause I, I get so upset over small things. These are things I'm working on and I have to just be like, I'm sorry, you know, and it helps me, it helps calm me down. Mm -hmm. It helps bring me back to a center. It helps remind me of my goal with her and, Mm -hmm. I, you know, I, I encourage you as parents to figure out your, your why, your parenting why. We do this as entrepreneurs, right? Like, what is your why for starting a business? What is your why for wanting to be a certain type of parent? Mm-hmm. Who is the type of person that you, you know, the values that you want your child to have? What kind of relationship do you want to have with them um, when they're adults? Those kind of things form your parenting why. If you want to be good friends with them when they're adults, if you want them to be, you know, free thinkers and and liberated children, you know, adults, if you want them to be able to come to you and and talk to you about things big and small, that's going to shape how you parent them. Right. So you have to have a foundation, but then you think about those things too. Okay, I I want those things for my children. Who do I have to become? That's the mirror right there. That's the mirror. (laughs) Who do I have to become in order for them to become these things that I wrote on this piece of paper? Right. And so it all brings, it's all a circle. We are, they're, they're teaching us and we're learning from them and we're both becoming better people if we allow the process. But when our egos get involved and they're just like, that's disrespectful you know, do as I say, not as I do. We're slowly killing little, their little spirits and we're shutting down their voices and then they grow up and they are codependent like me. They have yeah. a fear of being able to speak out 
for themselves and they have a hard time advocating for themselves. And so you have to know that there are natural consequences to, to your choices on how you parent. And those natural consequences show up in your children when they become adults. Yeah, I agree. It comes, it just comes back to the co-creation. And I also think in, and I go back to writing, journaling, just deciding like who you need to be, like you said, Yolanda, and then also just visioning what type of parenting feels good for you and not comparing yourself to how other people yes. do things too is a big one. And not compare your children either, right? Yes. Ooh, yes. Your child is, <laughs> Jaden is at 11 years old and then you got another 11 years old who's completely different. And yeah. parents will be like, well, why can't you be like him? Because he's not. Because yeah. he's all person. So right. don't compare your children. Don't compare siblings, you know, because that's hurtful. They can't, they are themselves and they, their brains are developing differently, right? even even within the same family. And the way you talk to your middle child may not be the way you communicate with your oldest child. So understanding that every child is an individual and that you have to treat each individual child in your family like an individual. You cannot, you know, you wouldn't communicate the same way with everyone, you know, you kind of right. change that up based on who the person is, right? Especially right. in an office environment. So if you think about it like that, like I need to communicate in certain ways with this child. I can be a little bit more assertive with this child. And with this child, I need to just be a little bit softer. It's just you. It's a skill knowing set. Them. It is a skill set. It Parenting is. is a skill set. Yeah. It's not something that you just wake up knowing how to do. Know. And I want those who are listening to have grace with themselves in that. Yes, front. Like, please. I don't care it don't matter, you know, cause you never know what type of child that you're going to get. And like you said, if you have one child and, and you end up having another child, it's a whole new journey, not only with the child you already had, but now with your parenting too, and they're different people. So just knowing that parenting is a skill set and it's okay if you don't know how to do it. But I think mm-hmm. just coming back to being committed to learning about yourself and then learning about your kids. So mm-hmm. Wow. This was, I could literally talk to you all day. I think we're (laughs) almost at, I think we are at an hour already. So I am just, this conversation was just so rich and so good. And I thank you so much for just everything that you shared today. I think that people are really going to take a lot from this episode and they're going to be able to like integrate it. I know, I feel like it's going to be one of those ones where you listen to a couple of times to just let it sink in. So (laughs) thank you so much much thank for being for here me. today. Yes. Thank you for having me. I, I I hope I hope that y'all um are gentle with yourselves through this process because it is hard yeah. and you will mess up because you're human and it's okay. Exactly. Exactly. That's what we're here to do. We're here to to grow and to learn. So yeah. yeah well Yolanda could you please share where people can find you so they can catch up with you. Yeah. So I have my website, parentingdecolonized.com. And you can actually get to all the, you know, all the podcast episodes on there, as well as my blog. And then I have my Facebook page, Parenting Decolonized. And I also have a Facebook group called Conscious Parenting for the Culture. It's only for Black parents. Um, It's co-ed. And this is where we are able to, you know, give you a lot of advice on how to, especially if you're transitioning, how to, how to be a more conscious, intentional parent. Yeah, I love that. Well, thank you. You guys definitely check those out. I think the more resources that we have, especially informed resources, the, I don't want to say faster, but I, th- I just feel like we'd be more prepared to have these conversations and, these, and start to make these changes in our own lives. So definitely check those resources out. And I thank you all for tuning in today. Till next time, take care. <laughs>